This is a wig. And before you tell me wigs have nothing to do with economics, let me point out that the global wig and hair extension market is valued at over $6 billion. The largest economy manufacturing and exporting this product is China, with Chinese wig exports accounting for more than 70% of the global supply. Now perhaps this comes as no surprise, as China is the dominant manufacturer of several industries, including those many would argue are more important and certainly more lucrative than wigs and hair extensions, such as apparel, textiles, basic metals, computers, machinery, tools, or cars. You see, there's hardly a sector you can name which China does not have at least 20% global market share of their manufacturing. And if you haven't noticed, that's a big deal for a lot of reasons. Despite this, China has actually seen its reign as the world's dominant manufacturer begin to wane since 2010, and emerging competitors may not be the economies you'd expect. Having said this, the US, Japan, and Germany are the second, third, and fourth largest manufacturing economies after China, and China is still home to a greater share of global manufacturing output than all three economies combined. It's unlikely we see wealthier countries compete with China's market share of global manufacturing efforts as scaling manufacturing capabilities is an expensive and lengthy process that is typically most successful when private sector demand to expand is assisted by government cooperation in the form of subsidies and tax breaks designed to incentivize incentivize foreign investment, domestic manufacturing, and greater employment. India is certainly an intuitive choice of a country that might be able to give Chinese manufacturing a run for its money thanks to their large and young population. But as discussed on economics explained in the past, India's GDP benefits far more from its global services economy than manufacturing thanks to its English-speaking population, putting India's economy more in competition with economies like that of Singapore and not the far larger authoritarian adversary in their backyard. So. Which economy is today's episode of Economic Oddness about? Which dark horse might emerge as a great manufacturing economy of the next two decades? For a long list of odd and economical insights, we are about to get into Mexico. In 1994, the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, took effect and opened up a new world of possibilities for Mexico. By removing trade barriers, this agreement allowed Mexican goods to be readily accessed by their neighbors in Canada and America, transforming Mexico from an isolated economy into one more open to international exchange. With a large population of young people and a higher fertility rate than countries like Brazil, France, Iran, the US, China, Mexico, much like India and Nigeria, see competing for manufacturing opportunities as a key way to ensure ample employment opportunities to a large and growing population. Having a large population can be an economic advantage, but if you're not able to provide that large class of people with employment, this quickly becomes a demographic disaster. Mexico's development is further incentivized by the importance of diversifying trade partners, a reminder we have seen on full display in recent months. For the last eight years, for example, tensions between China and the US regarding import tariffs and trade policies have bolstered production within Mexican borders as manufacturing in Mexico has become increasingly desirable to a US that looks to alleviate their dependency on trade with China. And while it's unlikely that Mexico replaces China China's role as a global manufacturer for all things, Mexico has much to gain by being a specialized manufacturer of a few key things, such as machinery and electronics. In an attempt to get the ball moving in these efforts, the Trump administration's proposed United States-Mexico-Canada agreement aims at standardizing automotive industry labor wages, bringing the necessary regulation and transparency to economies like Mexico, where informal markets are responsible for an enormous amount of economic activity. What does Mexico's manufacturing look like today? Well, for starters, because of its comparatively safer and more secure regulations, Mexico provides organizations with the insurance that their intellectual property will remain protected from theft. Mexico also offers cost-effective production options compared to China while greatly reducing transit time associated with importing into key markets like the US. Time, after all, is money, and nowhere is that sentiment more true than when dealing with supply chains. Global supply chain breakdowns during the COVID pandemic also assisted in shifting US trade dependencies from China to Mexico. And in 2021, Mexico became the number one trading partner with the US over Canada and China. After US imports from Mexico increased by 18.3% from the previous year, approximately reaching $390 billion. But Mexico's offering as a site for new manufacturing isn't based entirely on China's downsides or its geographical location. 
Whether you can believe it or not, Mexico's workforce actually provides a level of skill and efficiency that is now more economical than China's. In fact, unit labor costs in Mexico were on par with those found in China as early as 2014, and by 2019, manufacturing wages for certain industries fell to 20% lower than their Chinese counterparts. In many parts of the world, shipping out of Mexico also proves to be cheaper and faster than shipping from China, and within the Americas, it can be up to 90% cheaper. As a result, some of the largest corporations in the world have been moving parts of their manufacturing efforts to Mexico. Which companies, you ask? We're going to find out right after our new segment, What are the Odds? When you hear the word pyramids, what comes to mind? For many, it's easy to conjure up images of ancient Egypt, for some of us, Vegas. For me, it's unnerving flashbacks to Miss Susie's 10th grade geometry class. But for those who did grasp Basosceles' proofs faster than I, and did in fact think of ancient Egypt, what if I told you the largest pyramids in existence lie hidden beneath a mountain quite the ways away? Because the pyramids of Cholula are located in Mexico and stand at an impressive 66 meters high, with its base measuring 400 meters wide. Even more impressively than that, it has a volume of over 4.5 million cubic meters, almost double the size of the Egyptian pyramids. The pyramid was built thousands of years ago, but today can be recognized by the church at the top, built by Spanish conquerors centuries ago, who I imagine after coming across the pyramid thought to themselves, what are the odds? But you know, they said it in Spanish. Now, fast forward to today. In a world where we don't make hardly as many pyramids, but China manufactures 80% of the world's air conditioners and 45 times more personal computers than all other nations combined. Will Mexico in the near future be able to prove it's capable of producing necessities at a reliable scale? Many would argue Mexico is already proving this, as its automotive exports have skyrocketed 300% between 2002 and 2018, and today it's home to 89 of the top 100 auto part producers worldwide. So, who's actually relocating some of their manufacturing operations to Mexico? See if any of these brands ring a bell. So, could Mexico be the surprise contender to rival Chinese manufacturing prowess in the decade ahead? Well, with a large, highly educated workforce that graduates more engineers each year than even the US, and competitive labor costs for a growing population that rivals that of incumbent manufacturers, it may not be the oddest thing to see Mexico emerge as a dominant manufacturer in the next decade. 